On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we have the cause of the Newark ship fire. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So, Grand Costa d'Avorio, the ship that caught fire on July 5th up in the port of Newark, has been a subject of this channel quite a bit. We've done a lot of videos on this, not just because it's a ship and had a fire, or it's a car carrier and there's a lot of debate about cars being loaded on ships, but mainly because two Newark firefighters died on board this vessel. And the reason for the fire on board has now been re released via the company Grimaldi in establishing its liability for the fire. We're going to examine that through a story by Greg Miller over on Freight Waves. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new stories as they come in. So this is the story on Freight Waves, Newark ship blaze blamed on Ports America. Ports America is a terminal operator across the United States. Uh, they don't own the ports, but they operate the terminals. Ports America has been in the news for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is a lot of foreign companies have been trying to buy them, the latest of which was a Canadian uh, uh, pension company. But the fire is blamed on a Ports America-owned loaded vehicle. Grimaldi, the ship owner, filed its limits of liability, and in it, it accounted for the cause of the fire. So let's take a look here at Greg's story. So the fire started on board the ship due to one of Ports America's own Jeep Wranglers being used to load non-working vehicles according to Grimaldi Deep Seas. Now, this blaze resulted in the fire on board on July 5th, the death of firefighters Augusto, Augie Akabu, and Wayne Bull Brooks Jr. during those operations. There were 1,200 vehicles on board the ship. The ship was destined for West Africa. The ship had no, no electric vehicles on board, so we don't need to have the EV fight in the comment section. This ship was loading new and used vehicles, and it's the used vehicles that's a large part of this problem, along with what was being used to load them. Port Newark is leased and operated by Ports America. Grand Costa d'Avoria was at the berth, and a stevedoring company, this is a co company that's hired to move the vehicles on and off and lash them, was called American Marine Services. In the court filing on Wednesday, Grimaldi said this, quote, AMS, American Mar Marine Services, was loading used vehicle cargoes aboard the vessel and used a 2007 Jeep Wrangler to push non-running vehicles aboard. So there are three types of vehicles on board this ship. They are a combination of new and used, but more importantly, there are the ones that run. You can get in, turn the key, or hit the button and drive it up. Great, stevedores do that. There is a second type vehicle that doesn't run that has to be pushed by another vehicle up, pop it in the neutral and roll it up there. And third, there are vehicles that just won't move, in which case they got to be picked up and physically moved and dumped on the ship. American Marine Services used this 2007 Jeep Wrangler. And according to Grimaldi, uh, Ports America's Jeep Wrangler was responsible for its, uh, excuse me, Ports America owned Jeep Wrangler and was responsible for its maintenance, repair, and safe operation condition. AMS, through its employees, operated the Jeep Wrangler and had certain maintenance and repair responsibilities for its safe operations. All right, 2007 Jeep Wrangler. This is not a vehicle you'll see riding up and down the streets of Newark. These are vehicles being used that are usually no longer road or street legal. They've been involved in accidents. They, they can't pass an inspection. And so you modify them into kind of a Mad Max style vehicle to be able to push vehicles, put big bumpers on the front, and stevedores drive that vehicle while pushing another vehicle up the ramps. That's what was happening. And according to the report here that Greg has, says a fire started on the underside of the Jeep Wrangler while it was being driven by an AMS employee and they were pushing a non-running Toyota Venza from the terminal to deck 10 onto the vessel. So you're pushing in the interior of the vessel, all of a sudden the Jeep Wrangler starts to smoke and fire happens. What's not clear in the report or in this uh, um, news uh, story from Greg is what kind of fire prevention and protection they had for Ports America and AMS. Were their fire extinguishers readily available? Did they try to extinguish the fire? Did they have a response crew to respond to these? It's not clear this Jeep Wrangler was being inspected in terms of being road legal, but what type of maintenance and uh, uh, inspections were being done by Ports America and AMS on this vehicle? 
What we do find out is the fire quickly enveloped the Jeep Wrangler, generated thick black smoke. Remember, you're in the interior of a ship. There's nowhere for this uh, ventilation to go. You've got big blowers going on, but that's to handle carbon uh, monoxide coming from road exhaust, not for a burning vehicle. So you have the black smoke, you have an intense heat, and the drivers and lashers immediately left the, the vessel. Now, there should have been an alarm go off, the ship's crew should have been notified. Again, what's the responsibility of the stevedores to initially try to get a handle on it? According to Grimaldi, the ship's crew members attempted to extinguish the fire, but it quickly spread and intensified. So, big question here on this. What did they do to extinguish it? Did they use fire hoses? Did they use portable extinguishers? We know, uh, I know at least, that they use the ship's fixed CO2 system. The question is, when was it discharged? So for this ship, the ship is broken up into zones. And the zone, zone three is the zone right here, the big, huge block on the stern of the vessel. This is deck six up into the weather deck. Now, to deploy CO2 on a ship, you have to do a couple of things. Number one, you have to secure the ventilation and all the hatches. That had not been done because they were in the middle of a loading operation. So you would have to secure everything. I know for a fact that the topside weather deck uh, ramp right here where this light brown smoke is coming out was not secured, meaning that there was smoke billowing out and air billowing out of this, which means that if you ex use the CO2, it's going to vent out of there. I know that on board they did deploy the CO2 to the point that some of the firefighters on board did not know that and they opened up hatches and were literally overcome by CO2, but it's the timeline that I have a question with right now. So we know the Newark firefighters came on board and this is one of the reasons why it makes sense for Akabu and Brooks to be on deck 10 and trying to hit this vehicle because this vehicle was the start of the fire. And this appears to be what happened. The local firefighters arrived, Akabu and Brooks were reported missing, and then the priority shifted to search and rescue. It goes on here, after the two missing firefighters were recovered, Newark firefighters left the, sh the ship, Grimaldi said. The ship's crew continued their own efforts until the morning of July 6th. Okay, let's clarify that statement for a minute. It's not like they abandoned the vessel. They decided to pull out of the ship and do an exterior attack. Uh, they saw no reason to risk lives any further on board the ship, and they decided to do a basic surround and drown and keep the fire contained. Uh, but by that time, the fire had spread to other decks, and the cabin ordered the crew to leave the ship. At which point, by the way, Grimaldi had contacted a salvage company. They contacted Don John Smith, one of the best salvage companies in the world, to take over the salvage of the vessel and to initiate the firefighting. Freight Waves asked Port America for a comment uh, on this, a spokesperson uh, responded, quote, Ports America is aware of the following by Grimaldi. We continue to provide the U.S. Coast Guard with our full support and cooperation on its ongoing confidential investigation into this matter. Accordingly, we are unable to provide further comment at this time. So, yes, Ports America is not going to say their vehicle is the cause of the fire because then they assume the entire liability. Because what's happening right now is Gr Grimaldi is trying to limit its liability and it initiated a filing under what's called the limitation of liability act and the limitation of liability act is a confusing piece of marine legislation this is it right here so what it says is for admiralty claims arising within the u.s under the provisions of this act in cases alleging injury or loss due to negligence operations of the vessel the u.s may limit its liability to the value of the vessel after the incident from which the claim arose. This is a really interesting thing. You don't get liability which could be spread out among all the claimants based on the value of the vessel before the incident, but after the incident. So if the ve vessel sinks and all the cargo is gone, there's no liability. It, it's very unique in, in terms of maritime shipping, but this ship didn't sink. Remember, it is still there. And so there's a question about whether the ship is a constructive total loss, can it be salvaged? What's the actual uh, assets on the vessel? It goes on here. The act requires filing an action in federal district court within six months of receiving written notice of the claim. So one of the things that Grimaldi is trying to do is limit their liability in this action. 
Greg goes on to talk about this. Uh, Grimaldi is blaming the Jeep Wrangler, maintaining that the uh, Jeep Wrangler uh, is the cause of the deaths, which is not theirs. It would make the argument here it is either Ports America or American Maritime Services. The ship owner, quote, believes civil actions and claims will be asserted against it in an amount exceeding the total amount for which Grimaldi may be legally responsible for the pursuant of the Limitation Act. It goes on here. The ship owner said the legal discovery actions have been commenced by Ports America, AMS, and the Port Authority and the estates of the, of the two deceased firefighters. A formal claim has already been made by the estates of Akabu and Brooks, and Grimaldi has po posted a tort lien of $20 million in the form of a letter of undertaking. In the court filings, Grimaldi asked for the amount to be replaced by supplemental security of a little over $19 million for death and injury. And this is based on a formula generated of $400 per gross registered ton. Grimaldi is calculating that the value of the vessel and the pending freight is $15.9 million. And they get to that through this process where the value of what the value of the ship was prior to the accident, what it's going to cost to repair, to tow, to salvage. And they go from a $55 million ship down to $15 million or $15.9 million of liability. And I know that's complicated and I apologize for it, but, th but that's the nature of this being so Grimaldi is trying to put in place a, a cap number one on its amount of liability 15.9 million it's also asserting in its claim listen the fire is not our fault it is ports america and american maritime services because they were using a 2007 jeep wrangler that was not properly maintained because if it was properly maintained it shouldn't have exploded and caught fire pushing a toyota up the ramps and so what you're seeing here is the finger pointing going on. This is going to be the problem for the estates of the two Newark firefighters. It's going to be a problem for all the claimants going against Grimaldi at this time. Uh, Grimaldi can't just say the ship is a total constructive loss because uh, above the main deck uh, or, or the main through deck, deck five, and down the engine room and the hull are all intact. So all they really have to do is cut the... The, the superstructure off this vessel and put a new one on and they're off and running. So this is where Grimaldi is going to have the issue. The other issue that is generating from this is not just these lawsuits, but this story about why your stolen car may be in West Africa and what's being done about it. Because there's a big argument here that not only is this Jeep Wrangler the cause for the fire, but the, vest, the vehicles that were loaded on board contributed to that because a lot of these vehicles, number one, shouldn't have been on the vessel because they may have been, quote, stolen and loaded on here, but they also are used, uh, used vehicles. And used vehicles, unlike new vehicles, have very little regulation for loading on a ship. If you have a new vehicle, it's empty. It has less than a, a gallon of fuel on board. A new vehicle could be packed in the gills with in the back seat with stuff in the trunk. There's no telling how much fuel is on board because the fuel gauge will be broken. You don't know. And some of these vehicles are just dangerous in many ways. And who knows what is stored in them. And this creates the problem that we see happening in the port of Newark. That's what makes this case so important to understand. Because while we talk about EVs on board Fremantle Highway and Felicity Ace, and we're having this huge debate about electrical vehicles and loading them, this is an issue of loading new and used vehicles that are heading to Africa. And more importantly, the responsibility for safety in the port. We, you know, this doesn't even breach the issue about the Newark Fire Department's response or lack of response. Uh, the difficulties in extinguishing the fire on board a ship that burned for six days and the fact that there was not a coordinated response from not just Newark Fire Department, but from other fire departments in the area and the fact that the Newark firefighters were not well trained to go on board and fight a shipboard fire. They're well trained in other areas just not in this area. I'm not saying they're not untrained firefighters. I'm saying that they were not well versed and had the background and information necessary to tackle a fire like this. Very difficult case that's coming before us. And it's going to be interesting to see how it unfolds. 
I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and you can become a monthly yearly subscriber. Until our next episode, this is Sal signing off.